First and foremost, I'm very enamored of Property Guru, which actually is a reflection of a technology being used to sell real estate online, etc., which is very effective. I mean, coming up with a niche that actually makes real estate selling a bit more pleasant and uh, much more friction-free. And, uh, and this is what I applaud. So I'm of course honored to be, to be given this award. I dedicate this award to all the, the members of the YTL family, the extended family, and who, who were involved with me very early in the early 80s. When we were doing property at that time, we were just a construction company, but we decided to go into value added into property development as we could build competitively. And we, when we realized we had an opportunity in the early 80s when there was a recession and, the, and yet the government uh, wanted to build houses at a uh, very low cost at 25,000 ringgit. And then we get this team of ours, uh, this innovative team of ours, they are so hungry for innovation to come up with something. And at that time, there was a tender to uh, build low cost housing in Ipoh for uh, thousands of uh, units and we were awarded one package. And then when we were awarded, we realized that the five-story walk-up flats, which is standard at that time for low-cost housing at 25,000 ringgit, was not conscionable when we studied the design because it's only 600 square feet. And we realized from our studies that people who are poor have big families. So you can see there's only one bedroom for the parents and one bedroom for six or seven children squeezed into one bedroom. So that's pretty claustrophobic. So we think it's socially not conscionable. So we told our team, let's redesign something that's still at 25,000 ringgit and come up with a more and better environment on the same piece of land that we were awarded. Uh, come with something better designed with less density, but a bigger unit. And then we decided to have 12 standard designs for low cost housing at that time. And we knew every single component that's going to go into uh, this low-cost house, including a nine cents plate, every single small micro component uh, was computerized, even at that early stage of computerization. So you can assemble them very efficiently and build them with large quantities at a very uh, good quality and at a very efficient and fast to build. And that would be uh, meeting the demands of the people and we decided to have 741 square feet instead of five-story walk-up flat. We had a 741 square feet, looks like a terrace house. So we included one more bedroom, two bedrooms, and a living room where they can at least breathe. And that became such a huge success when we launched it. And then we sold more than 10,000 of those units. Of course, it's no-brainer. Who wouldn't want to invest in a 741 square feet that looks like a terrace house? So that's how our team did it. It was very difficult to do, but we did that. And from there, we, uh, we, we started to do uh, properties in Kuala Lumpur and we started to acquire land and opportunities came to acquire privatized projects in, uh, in Kampong Kerinci at that time. And then we decided to put some Spanish design uh, into it and people really loved it. But the greatest story is that the people who bought our homes in Bircham followed us to buy homes in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, that, that's the early journey in Pantai Hill Park, we call that. It was the third hill. It was Bangsa, and, and, and it's a beautiful hill, but nobody wants to come to this hill. Although it's a beautiful hill that looks at Kuala Lumpur, so we decided to name it Pantai Hill Park. Lots of green and a better design like the quite a lot of this uh, uh, Spanish design and people just loved it, Kuala Lumpur folks, etc. Sold at very competitive prices and it was sold out. And then of course we had Central Park uh, development. At that time uh, it was of course also a different economic cycle but it was an abandoned project and then the, the government kind of gave us opportunity to take over. There was a lot of abandoned building etc. within that site. We took the challenge because we thought, well, this is a property in Kuala Lumpur, so we should, we should give it a try. And when we came up with that, we found how difficult it was. Just the name Sentol, people associate with crimes. And nobody is, and, and I was persuaded, if you wanted to redevelop this property, 
don't use the name Sentul. Then I did research and found that Sentul is the name of a tree. How does the name of a tree like Sentul turn it into a, a connotation of crime? And then I realized all Malaysian towns, we are very verdant, uh, bucolic naming country. In the one sense, all our towns are named after trees. Pulau Pinang, Ipoh, Tanjung Rambutan. <laughs> so how could a name like Sentul degrade into crime? So I said, no, that's the challenge. We're going to keep the Sentul name and we're going to rebuild people to love the green, etc. That, that in came the Sentul East and Sentul West. Sentul East will be named after spices and Sentul West will be named after trees. And we decided to make it very green. Uh, in the center spine of this development is a 35 acre park, etc. And the rest is history. So people begin to love. Uh, what uh, YTL does in his property and what it stood for with beautiful architecture, etc. <laughs> the better story is as our buyers get more prosperous from Bircham to, 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 to Pantai Hill Park, the same buyer buys now our central properties, etc. So that, that's to me a joy that you could continue to build for different generations and do not despise small beginnings because the small beginnings when people were poor at that time became much more able through the economic history themselves in Malaysia and decided to buy your own homes because you provided good memories for them of the homes you built early. So that's a fantastic lesson for me. Malaysian real estate has got two components that are very efficient. The economic ratios of two areas. One is in terms of land versus building costs. The land cost in Hong Kong, for example, is unevenly skewed towards land. The building cost is probably a tenth of the land cost. In Malaysia, it's the reverse. So it's quite economic. So the land cost is not expensive. So the ultimate cost of pricing that land to the building is at a good ratio. So definitely the Malaysian properties, very well built with great architecture, per square foot basis, are much more, um, one of the most competitive in this region and in the world because it can be built well, but the price of the land is not expensive. So it doesn't flow through the building cost, unlike in Tokyo or in Hong Kong. So this is a good ratio. The second good ratio is the properties in shopping malls, uh, good real estate, because the ratio of rental to sales is also very uh, efficient. So for example, in, uh, in, in Hong Kong, or in Tokyo, the rental versus sales are good. They're high convert, but the rental is very high. In Malaysia, it's also quite a high convert, but the rental is very low. So the margins, because all branded goods sell the same price, right? Every economy in the world, they sell the same price. So the margins are much higher in Malaysia in shopping malls than let's say in Hong Kong, although the sales are just as good. So that, that's the reason uh, Malaysian shopping centre uh, became a thriving uh, malls all over the place. And we had a history for this. Uh, we built Bintang Walk in the early 1990s, uh, late 90s. And we were given two shopping centres, Lot 10 and Star Hill. At that time in history, we acquired two shopping centres. And at that time, it was a red light district, etc. And, and the shopping wasn't that, that uh, popular. Uh, it was not thriving, and uh, some, there were some branded uh, uh, brands like LV already in Star Hill, but the food court were, were filled with, uh, with students from Bukit Bintang Girls School at that time. So it was not like positioned very well despite it being a prime property. So once we acquired a property, we realized that ah, good things are not cheap and cheap things are not good. There's a reason you acquire it for a reasonable price. But there's a reason for it, the cash flow was negligible. And then we realized that the, the sales of all these branded goods weren't very, very large. And there's a reason for that, because there was a duty of 40%. So most people went to Singapore with zero duty on branded goods to sell. So I, I remember that Prime Minister at that time uh, asked me for, for some views on how to make Malaysia a prime shopping center. Why can't we be like Singapore, uh, for example? 
And I did the research and I told the Prime Minister at that time, if you can remove the 40% duty, and I've spoken to all the big brand owners, they will really invest here. And he said, is that, is that all? And I said, yeah. And actually the government at that time approved the Malaysia duty-free and branded goods 40% within three months. And then the rest is history. And they allow us to do bintang walk. At that time, there were regulations and bylaws that you cannot have alfresco cafes because there is a silly bylaw there at that time in history that prevents all this development. And the, the government and the bureaucrats at that time were very progressive. Yes, why not? And then the bintang walk today, as you can see, about 50 million people walk on this mall. It's a bit like Orchard Road, like Sean Elisi, etc. So that actually change the game of shopping center. And Malaysia, as you can see, CNN voted is one of the most viable shopping uh, cities, Kuala Lumpur, uh, in the world. And that's not, uh, uh, that's not uh, uh, wrong in statistics. It is correct because the ratio of sales and rental is very efficient in, in Kuala Lumpur. And also the real estate price, when we bought it at that time, was only 200 ringgit a square feet. Now the price has come to 5,000. And there's a reason for that because uh, it's efficient. The sales and the shops are doing pretty well in this area. Well, I think what's very important for Malaysia is that we, we have developed a quite reasonable physical infrastructure. And now we have DNB, 5G and all that, a good digital infrastructure from Cyber Jaya days. We have a di digital vision uh, to develop div digital infrastructure. And we have also quite good practitioners of building infrastructures like airports, uh, ports, and uh, trains like ERL, and also all these transport systems. So we are quite, quite good in logistics. And we've learned from China, uh, Alibaba on singles day, in a single day, can do 35 billion US worth of business and deliver the goods within a single day. And that's because of their physical infrastructure and their digital infrastructure. The physical infrastructure, the fast trains, all their ports and all those logistics that they have are so efficient they could deliver it. And then the digital infrastructure are the pay payment systems and the automated distribution, all the software enables this. So we should learn uh, from this. Uh, we are not far away from China in that sense. We already get uh, uh, at least a, a blueprint uh, a smallish blueprint on that. Why can't we develop more? I would love to see uh, uh, the fast train being done from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur. That has been touted for a long, long time. It's about time we do it because I would love to see this corridor become a megalopolis of what? Of green energy and data centers and all the technologies to do with digital, right? Around a fast train. And if you study the, the, the experience of a uh, fast train uh, having a huge impact on the development of real estate value in, in uh, Taiwan, for example, the fast train from Taipei to Kaohsiung really changed the real estate along this corridor. And Taiwan, along this corridor, you can see has a lot of semiconductor plants and all this, all this uh, development became um, uh, very prosperous the corridor. So we should do the same. Make this super corridor, a megapolis corridor, but at least have a vision. And we will produce green energy in this place and all, all the data centers will be so-called um, enabled by green energy and, and get the, this whole corridor welcoming investors all over the world in this very important uh, digital firepower to put power into the physical infrastructure that we already have. This will put Malaysia on a map.